Hey, hello! This is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration to help us in the process of getting students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I work at IE Business School Publishing, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Well, Engagers, and today we have our first repeat guest. And as you might have guessed, it, it is Pete Jenkins. Pete, are you prepared to engage? I certainly am. <laughs> as you probably already know from episode three, Pete Jenkins is an international speaker, advisor, and trainer in gamification. He also took the number one spot in the Gamification Guru's Power 100 in 2016. He founded the company Gamification Plus, LTD, and has since advised and trained companies of all sizes, both in the UK and internationally on the use of gamification. He's also the chair of the GAMFED, uh, where he helps spread the use of gamification best practices to benefit as many people and businesses as possible. He's also the founder and organizer of Gamification Europe, and he's been an entrepreneur in residence at the University of Brighton for nine years. So that's very interesting for the people interested in education as well. So he's also researching gamification for HR. He lectures on gamification and entrepreneurship at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels at Brighton University, I gather. And over the past 15 years, he has built and sold two, not one, but two businesses. He's as well the ambassador for Brighton Hub Chamber of Commerce. Pete, is there anything that we're missing? Anything you want to uh, jump in and add to this intro? Um, what am I going to add? <clears throat> With Gamfit, I've been, I'll soon have been chair for, for four years. So I'm currently looking for fresh, cha- fresh talent to uh, replace me <laughs> at the top. To, to jump in. Yeah, so um, come join GamFed, join up, volunteer, and pretty soon you could be quite high up. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a very like a very interesting challenge to to the engagers out there. It's good. Anyone who's passionate about gamification and spreading best practices, they'd be a good fit for coming on board with GamFed and getting involved. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting challenge to to take up. So any of you out there? might be thinking about it. Well, it's it's the right time. <laughs> so Pete, um, we would like to know, what does a, a regular day with, with Pete Jenkins look like? I know you travel a lot. I know you do many different things, but if you could call something a regular day, a normal day with, with Pete, what would it look like? I think my wife would like me to have a regular day <laughs> and what, what it looks like. It's really tricky to do that. Right now, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm in the middle of delivering a five-day intensive postgraduate module in gamification for business for master's students at the University of Brighton. So all day Friday, all day today, and the next two days is <clears throat> fully immersing a bunch of students in gamification um, from across the gamut of it, really, from applying it to marketing through to HR to changing the world for the better and uh, the techniques and knowledge to do that. Hmm. Fantastic. It's fantastic. That's that, that's the kind of class that many, many of us would have wished to have, whether in the university, in the undergrad, or in our master's degree. <laughs> oh, God, I wish I'd had it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. Certainly, certainly would. So, Pete... I mean, uh, well, yeah. one of the things I like about that, the teaching side, is it makes me, it forces me to stay up to date, because there's always a few students who get super keen, and look at the latest research, and test you, and ask you difficult questions. <laughs> which really helps me when I then afterwards and then go back into the corporate world and making sure I'm up to date and doing the latest, applying the latest theories and all the right things to do with it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Very, I mean, apart from that, oh, yeah. what does a, a normal day look like? I might be speaking like at the Serious Games Conference in Canada last week or running a training course somewhere in the world on gamification, which was the week before, or planning my own events like the conference you were talking about. And I've got quite a few mentoring clients at the moment, which are often gamification companies themselves. And it's about helping them with big, scary projects <laughs> and making sure they do them well and having a bit <laughs> of oversight. Survive <laughs> to the challenge. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you've got a big client and you've, you really want to make sure the gamification is applied well, you need, sometimes you need an extra outside viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. That's very useful. Yeah, and it's really interesting for me because it means I get involved in some interesting projects. The, the bad thing is you can't talk about them too much. Uh, this is very true. <laughs> Maybe once they've happened. Maybe I'll get them to speak about it themselves at a conference. That's my cunning plan. Hmm. 
makes a lot of sense. So, Pete, we would like to now dig into and take like a sort of a spin on, on this uh, fantastic days that, that you have because it sounds very exciting and, and a place uh, many people would like to be in, talking about gamification, organizing events in gamification, giving classes on gamification. And we would like to take to take you to what we like to call would be something around your favorite failure or, or your favorite fail when, when creating games, gamification. And the frame for this is whether it took you, because always failure leads us somewhere, and that could be to massive learning, or it could be even for a massive future success as well. So tell us a story where, where you failed and, and that you would say you learned a lot or, or it led you to a future success and how, how that happened. Well, I did. Funnily enough, I have one of those classics, which was um, which I'm always telling people not to do, and then I went and did it myself. <laughs> <laughs> which was, um, <clears throat> I often tell people not to come up with the game first, but to go through the process, understand your user and your client, whoever it is you need to affect, and uh, and then build it from there, and you'll end up with a different game. And then we did a <clears throat> did this mistake of speaking to a client, getting really excited about some of the content they had to work with which inspired a game idea to help them get more uh, more customers or more subscribers. But we hadn't actually properly listened to what the client wanted and the behaviors they wanted. We just got carried away with creating this marvelous game. And we had a very upset client. It was like, what? why have you wasted all our time with reading all this stuff, which isn't what we wanted? And I was like, no, oh, I've done it. This is what we tell people not to do. So... It, <clears throat> Really, it's about listening to the client, but also making sure you go through a proper design process and not getting carried away, no matter how much fun you think the game is. And, and that's, that's the thing I see all the time as well. Is it's just the stuff we have to come up with is so much fun that you just get very passionate about it and you override other instincts. And, uh, and, and worst of all, I had a gut instinct as well, which was that we hadn't done the, the process and that it was going to go wrong. But we went with it because it was such a good game. And then <laughs> failure. And it happened. It so. happened. And it's not happened again because I'm quite insistent that we always run through our, pro our process to do this. Yeah, I, I, I guess that w whichever process you pick that has been tried and tested, you better stick to it because it, it, unless you're going to try to create a new process, a new way of doing things, just um, going against whatever it is you believe in, it, it's it's going to be a hard pill to swallow after it doesn't work out. It is, and you've got no excuse when it if it goes wrong as well. You're like, well, of course it's gone wrong. We didn't follow our own process. <laughs> so that, that I, I would say there's, for me at least, there's two main learnings there. And the, the, the first one is what I mentioned about if you have a process that you follow and that you know has success, well... Uh, you know live up to it and and follow your your desired process it can be your own it can be somebody else's um one of our past guests said uh, I, when i asked them about the process they said well i, I don't make up anything up any anything new i just you know <laughs> i go with something that's already created test it and, and that and i know it's working so i go with it and that's that's a key as well and the other thing as usual it's important to and this is something that comes up recurrently is to understand and know your users as much as you can, as you possibly can, so that the design that you're creating makes sense for them. Absolutely. <laughs> Is there anything yeah. else you would like to, to bring up? Um, no, not really. I'm all upset now. Thank you. Back out. Back out. <laughs> so let, let's let's change that upset and and go to a radically 180 degree spin on the the biggest challenge that you faced and actually solved. That something that you're especially proud of when when using gamification. Now, funnily enough, <clears throat> this is one I can't really talk that much about. <laughs> you don't need to name any I names. Can, That's I can fine. talk about it in principle um, because the rest of it's under under one of the heaviest NDAs I've ever signed. Um, <laughs> one of the longest, at least. Yeah, yeah. I, to be honest, it felt like if I told my wife about it, I would lose the business, the house. And... <laughs> <laughs> It was a good, good NDA. I mean, I learned a lot from it. But that's another story. Um, <clears throat> in essence, it's a customer loyalty scheme for hundreds of thousands of people. And it's one of the areas I think that loads of brands do badly in, which is getting, getting people in. They sign people up to their loyalty schemes, and they send you constant emails about the points you've got. And then you've got nothing you can afford to spend them on yeah, until you've been doing it for a long time and you've finally got somewhere. And anytime you're not 
spending those points, but you have them, you actually have quite a negative association with the brand, yeah, I think. And then in fact, there's some research about it. I've just forgotten the, the word for it, but one of my students mentioned it today, so I was very pleased with them. Um, <laughs> so it's how do you turn that around? Yeah, so what we did with this one was come up with lots of ways to encourage their customers to spend the points as often as possible, uh, particularly on games and challenges that reinforce their connection to the brand. Yeah, and, and our, kind of our aim was like, can they spend some points at least every other day in this instance to rather than accumulate them, just actually use them as an excuse to keep building more little brand connections and positive reinforcements. And I really like what we came up with and I can't wait for someone to come and let me talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> to give you permission to, to yeah. say the specifics. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm aware it's launched and uh, it's going to be a year of things happening before we can talk about it, I'm pretty sure. But it, it's, I, I'm so excited to see if all the theory works. Yeah, because <laughs> right now we think we've come up with something amazing that will really reinforce a brand's connection to its customers and... If we're lucky, you know, that could really stir up a whole customer loyalty scene, which would be a really nice big impact. Ah, that would be fantastic. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to use a classic example of gamification because that's exactly what I remembered when when you were talking about this. I'm, I'm using Duolingo a lot more lately. And there's one thing that these, I think it's lingots, what they, what they, what they call the, these like rubies that you get. And they're like constantly encouraging you to spend them on something like, oh, this week you double your wager or something like that so that you get twice as many of these lingots. And then with the lingots, you can buy a, a weekend freeze or something like that so you don't have to, to, to lose your streak even if you... Your streak freeze, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you can buy clothes for the owl and you can... I don't know if I'm I'm, I'm going to get a lot more options right now, but it, it's funny that it, every week, at least once a week, it gives me back a... a, a, a uh, something that reminds me that you should be spending your doubling your bets on your on your streak on your streak on on Duolingo and I'm doing it every week I've I've been using it for at least a month in a row so it's working pretty well on me That's pretty cool. Uh, funny enough I've been using it myself for just over a month to learn <laughs> to learn Portuguese as uh. Um but my whole family's using it. My wife and my daughter who's 6 or soon to be 6 as well. And it's really interesting watching different people use it and in, and interact with the different experience points and the lingot points. My wife already, see, she spent all the lingot points she could, and then she got, within two weeks, she was like, that's it, there's, there's no point in me buying anything. I was like, boy, everything that was of interest, which I thought was fun. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. that was a, the point of the virtual currency not working. Are, are you all going into Portuguese, or are you going for different Yeah, languages? we're going on holiday to Brazil, so mm. we're going to learn Portuguese. <laughs> Something basic, at least, right? Yeah, yeah, I can definitely order wine and beer now. <laughs> <laughs> Basics. <laughs> Basics, yeah. <laughs> Certainly. Well, Pete, we're going to move on into something that I am very, very interested in always, and it's about the process that you follow. When you, when you create some games, some gamification, what is the process that you go through? Of course, we don't have a, a one-hour masterclass as, as many people will have in Gamification Europe to listen to the, to the whole thing and experience it ourselves. But can you, can you run us through how your process looks like? I can, actually. Um, we have a seven-step process, which when we remember to run it, always, uh, <laughs> always works. Um, <clears throat> and what I quite like about telling people about it is actually there's no gamification until about halfway through. <laughs> It's the first step is, and this is something we developed over the years, built on Kevin Wareback's framework, and then sort of fleshed out and with other bits added in as we found we needed them. Okay. 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 So the, the first step is the business objectives, agreeing those, and keeping them as simple and as few as possible. Because we find that if, as soon as people have multiple business objectives, you start finding game mechanics um, that fight each other in terms of their end outcome and whether they actually match the business objective. Okay. Yeah, but if you do, do, have do, to you, have... do you prioritize them in, in any ways? Do you, do you force your, well, force, you, do you ask your, your clients to prioritize those objectives? If there are multiple ones, we do indeed. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, at the end of this stage, that we did two things. Once we got all the objectives and we prioritize them, 
the first thing we do is actually send them back to the client and say, is this really what you said? Because in my experience at this point, they go, oh, no, that's not what I meant when I was talking to you. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, this is the best place to avoid wasting loads of time later. Yeah. And is the key step that we missed earlier, funny enough, with my failed story <laughs> game. Yeah, it was, was reinforcing and agreeing those business objectives. But also this step, this is where we check whether it's right to be using gamification or is it a broken process that needs fixing. Marigo does a good talk about that. And, mm. uh, but this, this is the right bit to say, maybe you don't need gamification for this one or not yet. Hmm. That, that reminds me as well of the talk of Anjay this year, well, last year in Gamification Europe about when he mentioned solutioneering that sometimes yeah. it's not what you need you need to check what's the problem and if you if it makes sense to solve it using a, a big gun like gamification yeah definitely <laughs> so what's step number two step number two i call gathering intelligence this is not about the users or the players but more about and especially as we work with organizations a lot it's about the organization's development plans about their um, companies have nearly always got plans for a future website or a new intranet or, and they've probably got some spec or wireframes about that so it's about sort of planning our gamification to work with what they're planning to build not what exists at the moment you know, to try and match up so that we're all on the same wavelengths in the future when we actually deliver and I see I've seen a few of these examples outside that business where people have launched gamification projects just as the company completely changes all the ways they interact with their staff because they haven't just looked at the new um, values and systems that are being rolled out. And I think, well, what a waste. What a waste of all that energy. And the other thing we do here is we work, we find out what's already being measured. Because in my experience, setting up something new, a new measurement of something is can be quite expensive. Maybe there's a new manual process needed or even a, a device that needs to be created to capture the measurements. So where we, where, what we do here is find out everything that's already being measured and see if we can create a game that effectively hits the business objectives within those because that will save a lot of money and a lot of time and quite often also gives us the before and after figures which tell us whether it was a success or not. That's beautiful because that way you, you're using what's already existing so you can measure, as you said, the before and after. Yeah, this is probably because I, I, my first few example projects were all with small businesses who had no money. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you learn quickly from that. The third step is from uh, WebEx framework, which is about defining the target behaviors of the users. So for each business objective, we run through listing all the different target user behaviors, what actual things do you want to change. Um, we also then double check how we can measure quality and quantity of those at this point and do that for each business objective. So for me, this often ends up as one of the longest lists. Uh, yeah, a that, really long that's list what I was going to ask you because that one business objective can imply a, a ton of behaviors, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and to be honest, the longer this list, the more successful the project is, I tend to find. And the, the list of metrics to measure them is quite often even longer because for each thing you want to change, you probably need to measure quality and quantity and maybe some other effect. You know, you might be measuring the quantity of the behavior, the quality of that, and then also maybe like how that impacted sales somewhere else. So you might have three measurements for one behavior. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so, but we do find the more effort you put in that, then, you know. Yeah, the, the stronger the foundations, the, better, the, bit, the taller you can make the building. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly it. But also, actually, um, it helps you not miss key steps like the uh, onboarding of people into the gamification or uh, perhaps an interaction on a page that you hadn't thought about that is really key to uh, sharing it and building viral success within the organization for the gamification platform, stuff like that. It includes a lot of things around the outside of whatever you're building as well, the stuff that helps it be an actual success when you roll it out. Hmm. Beautiful. Now that takes us to step four, right? It does indeed. My favorite step, actually, is what I call player type strategies. And here we look for three things. The demographics of the players, you know, age, sex, wealth, as much information as you can get from a normal standard marketing point of view. 
about them. This is also where we do research around the player types, the type of people that are involved that we need to change. And we tend to work with NJ's uh, user type Hexad. I think it's really easy to use and, and fits really well with how we work and, and the stuff we come up with. I've not found a better <laughs> player type white solution yet. And the third thing we do is do a bit of um, user research on what rewards would actually work. Yeah, in case we need, well, quite often you need something to entice people into the gamification in the first place. And maybe you need some bigger prizes or not necessarily prizes, but what are those motivations that we can reward people with for success within the game? And this I find is different in different geographies and different departments and different countries. So it involves quite a lot of focus groups. And we come out with really interesting rewards people are after. Team-based, individual-based, and uh, really specific sometimes that you wouldn't just pull off a normal, you know, a list of general rewards. Like we've had uh, someone who always wanted to pet an elephant, a team that all wanted a day out at an animal sanctuary. These are not things that would appear in a normal list. But the more specific and relevant you make it to the people, then the more likely they're going to actually put the effort in and be motivated. So this is one of the areas where we spend as much time as possible early on. Yeah. Investing the, the right time can make a difference in that yeah. section for sure. So what's step five? Step five, design a prototype. Get busy. You've got all the information. Um, if, you're, if you're really good, we would start with a theme at this point. Because uh, once you know all this stuff about the business objective and the people, the the theme should sort of spring out to you, you know, whether it's pirates or something loosely based on the latest Avengers film or something like that. Yeah, whatever's current that everyone's into, is there something you can use to glue it all together? Or is it like, you know, the next World Cup or something like that? Because we find if you've got a theme, the rest of the development moves quite quickly, positively forwards. Yeah, the theme tends to integrate quite well with, with narrative as well. And that's, at least mm -hmm. in my experience, something I've found that makes a massive, massive difference in the engagement. Definitely. So with the theme and the narrative, then you start choosing game mechanics to suit those player types, build a prototype, play test it, and reiterate that process quite a few times. Lots of, <laughs> lots of prototyping, lots of stripping it back, lots of tweaking it, lots of playing. Lots of getting as many people as possible involved of different ages, sexes, game types, you know, everything that fits within your player type strategies and keep doing that. And actually, we, although people talk about hundreds of iterations and things like that, I would say the fine tuning, you've got the nub of it after like four or five play tests. Yeah, and from then on, it's fine tuning. Um, and at this point, we would then build a specifications document so this is where you're starting to choose who's actually going to build the gamification project. And this is partly because we don't always build it ourselves. <clears throat> We're a consultancy that works with other platform providers and um, sometimes in-house teams. I like working with in-house teams. They're often really excited to work on a gamification project and come up with something really excellent if they are given the opportunity. Hmm. Of course. Giving the right motivations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in fact, funnily enough, that's, I've stolen my thunder as part of step six, which is production, which is choosing the team to work with. Yeah, So I would start by saying, is it possible to use an internal team? One of my early projects was with a, a company providing, I'm going to call it advice for workplace pensions and the people who use it and who have those pensions, the employees. And the in-house team were so excited to be able to do something fun that they came up with an amazing um it delivery of the games that we came up with um mm. which was just fantastic to see and everyone was super happy and it has that positive side effect of more motivated team at work which is one of the things you should get from gamification yeah it's, it's their own solution in a way yeah yeah but you know they've chosen to work on it as well exactly. so uh, they've got a bit of autonomy and they're motivated for it this is also the stage where you just do good project management. I don't, I don't really bang on about that. Everyone should just have a good project manager. It really helps. And if you've like uh, outsourced it or if you've passed it off to another team, then when it comes back, you need to do more testing and play testing because it will have changed from your specification. 
<laughs> if there's one thing I've noticed with game designers, for instance, they'll often avoid something difficult and put something they know how to do it, which to a certain extent means things get done on time, but it doesn't necessarily fit with exactly what you asked for and whether it's still fun. So you have to give that a go and check and check again. And what will be fin the final step? Well, actually, the final step of the production is to roll it out to a small group of people so that you can actually test it for real. Um, and this is another area where I see clients, they get really excited about what they've created, so they immediately roll it out to everyone, which is a very risky thing to do. Much better to find a subset of people and test it on them and then fine-tune it and tweak it on that because they will find something that breaks it or they can game the system, and you need to spot that as soon as possible. And also, if you're rolling out to different countries, you should roll it out in a to a small subset in each place first as well. So it's not it's not even necessarily just one rollout. It's probably a series of them, depending on how big an organization you're working with or audience. That makes a lot of sense. But I have to say, that your seven step process has many steps in between, and that's that's. Oh that's, yeah, yeah. The, the step, <laughs> the step but that, but that's very good because it's very very detailed as well. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. And the seventh step, I haven't even got these. Oh. Which is, what do you do after you launch? <laughs> because uh, you can't just let it run. You've got to manage it. Yeah. So uh, watching out for those people gaming the system, checking that each game mechanic actually works, and then deciding whether to tweak it or turn it off if it doesn't. And uh, developing new features and new content to keep it fresh for people, particularly if you want to engage them for the long term. What's the plan? What are you going to do in three months, six months, nine months to keep people engaged and using it? You know, this is super important in like long-term loyalty schemes or long-term staff engagement because you want to keep them on board for many years. Yeah, definitely. And and how, how have you? Do you have any any like time frame or or do you just keep clients, so to speak, for life? It's not really for life, but do you do you when when it's those kinds of projects? Do you do you tend to look after them? For quite a while, do you say, well, we're going to be here for the first X amount of months or years? How, how do you, in general, would you say you manage that? I manage that by finding out how big their budget is and then fitting within that, which generally means, um, gosh, for a marketing thing, I would probably want to do something fresh every three months. Um, certainly the first month or two of any rollout, there should be quite a lot of oversight and tweaking. Um, for internal stuff, more often turns into six months refreshes or new features and things like that. Um, it depends how much and how many people they've got inside uh, an organization who are looking after these things as well. We, we quite quickly end up becoming mentors and just uh, oversight from a distance with quite a lot of projects. Makes a lot of sense. So Pete, we this like story part or, or more going into details and, and fine tuning everything is this part is now kind of over and we're going to mm. go now for what I like to call the rapid fire questions. So here it's going to be quick advice or quick ideas or things like uh, the the first question which is about the best practices or 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 a small element that or maybe it's even big but it's that one thing that you would say probably any gamification project that is not using this it would certainly benefit from from using this this element or this idea what would you say is is that best practice for for gamification i think it's actually to get as many viewpoints as possible involved as early as possible um <clears throat> certainly a to, best practice yeah i mean because if it's quite rare i think for a game designer to build a game on their own that's fun for lots of people. Yeah, that takes a really skilled game designer. Much I've watched people spend weeks crafting something that's, yeah, it's all right. And then as soon as you get a few people involved, within two or three hours, there's something much deeper, much richer, much better, and more fun. Because you need to get other people's input in order to find out what is going to engage them. And, and I think that's probably the most important thing. And it's sometimes the hardest thing to let to let your game or your gamification out earlier than you might want to. But it'll benefit from it very strongly. <laughs> l l l losing a bit the control and letting letting it flow a bit more, right? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, just the fact that ideas develop much better when there's multiple brains on it. 
<laughs> Definitely. Pete, what is your favorite game? Uh, this changes, okay? But at the moment, it's called Battle of Polytopia, mm. which is a super cool little um, strategy game for the mobile, for the mobile device. Um, I have always been a fan of Civilization and those sort of games, and this is this kind of encapsulates how to get it right on a small screen. Um, funny enough, I think it's designed by one developer, so it's one of those examples where it's <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> yeah, it may, maybe he involved many people in the testing and the checking and his ideas, etc. Possibly, <laughs> I was introduced to it by my colleague Vasilis, um, and I've now wasted many hours of my life playing it. <laughs> um, we even even today, you see, we were doing a multiplayer battle asynchronously on our mobiles in it, in between teaching and other things, and uh, I just think there's a lot to learn from it as well. So I do other types of favorite game for me are ones particularly on mobile where they've taken the game designers take one game mechanic and build a whole game around it, and that I find fascinating because then you can really see how it's done well. Yeah, I've forgotten the game, but this is found on the other a few months ago where there was one mechanic which was teleporting and that was all you could do as a character but how they did the game was really interesting to make that work hmm. sounds like a very interesting mechanic to explore yeah but i think any any mechanic where you've just got one and you've got to make it really engaging because you're only working with one shows you what's possible with it yeah whether it's even just a timer what can you do with a timer hmm. a time limit what can you change how can you make it more exciting? Yeah, makes makes sense as well. So, Pete, is there anybody that you would like to listen to interviewed in Professor Game? Ideally, that hasn't come up before, but I'm I'm not sure if you've heard every single interview. So, so whomever comes up to your mind is would be would be great. Uh, do you know what? I was thinking about this the other day. I would like because I like to stir things up. I'd like to hear from a gamification skeptic. <laughs> okay, because I think you learn a lot from that. And I was thinking many years ago, I briefly heard um, from one of the creators of Zombies Run, you know that game, which is a, a really good game for getting you out and running. Okay, yeah. So for me, it describes what gamification is yeah, uh, in its epitome, which is it feels completely like a game, but you have the objective met, which is to go out and run more. But the founder I spoke to was, uh, or I listened to was Adrian Hom, one of the creators of Zombies Run. And he, he hated the term gamification and thought it was purely a game that he created. But it was quite uh, interesting in how he talked about it. And I'd like to see, because it's been two or three years, whether his thoughts have changed or, you know, let's hear from a, a skeptic of the whole subject of gamification and see what how that adds to our knowledge. Yeah, yeah, that would be super interesting. Recently, Andrzej, on his interview, he, he one of the pre people he mentioned was Ian Bogost, who was... Uh, Oh, yeah, he's openly opposing an, an antagonist to to the gamification world in general. So, yeah. so I think those contrarian views would be would be interesting to have as well in the in the show. So I'll try to get them for sure. Yeah, well, any challenge makes us think a bit deeper, a bit harder, and hopefully we'll come we'll do better stuff because of it. Oh, for sure. The the, the it's it's funny because the the question. Uh, Andre, he said he sat down to design a good question to ask him. And he said, well, he asked him was, well, if you think that, you know, gamification designers are doing a terrible job, why do you not call on game designers who are actually, in your view, a lot better to help the gamification designers to improve their designs and to make them fascinating? <laughs> so the guy said, answered something like it was uh, benevolent terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure he would be a, a very interesting character to have to have in the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that kind of that kind of responses get tell you that he's certainly probably a very smart guy and knows his thing, and that he he could bring some some new stuff to the to the table as well. Um, Pete, is there any book that you would recommend the engagers to read? I would recommend loads. Because <laughs> um, the more you read, the better. Um, if you could recommend game, maybe one or two, wh I knew which would those that. be? So, right, I think right now I would recommend uh, Super Better by Jane McGonagall. Okay. Um, not her first. It's a second gamification book. So, I think second ones are interesting uh, because people go deeper. Yeah. The first one, Reality is Broken, is a fantastic book. It's a great one for building passion about gamification. Um, a little bit old now, but still 
very relevant. But super better, I think, would be good to listen to because, to be honest, it'll make all your listeners healthier after they've read it, which I think would be doing my bit for good. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And it's definitely a great book, for sure. Pete, what would you say is your is your superpower when designing gamification? My superpower? I think it's turning any problem or hitch into an opportunity for a better interaction or engagement with a player or user. <clears throat> deep, because deep into the woods, that that's probably the best thing you can have. Yeah, I, I think, and it goes back for me for years, even into my entrepreneurship stuff, which is one of my earliest clients went bust, bankrupt. And uh, I just looked after everyone involved in the process and ended up with three clients out of it. The existing client, when he started something new, the, and the, pre, the, the business that went bust um, was split into two, and both of those became clients as well because they were all looked after during the process. So out of this very negative thing where income was a risk, you know, and a client had gone, came three. And ever since then, I've just taken that same approach. Like, it's not whatever it is. It's probably just an opportunity to get to know someone better or to get to know the issue better so that you can come up with something better because of it. And, uh, and I, I quite like com random conversations you have with people. Like, oh, I could, you could never gamify this. And I do take that as a real challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I quite like turning that around in just a few minutes into a couple of examples. And they'll go, oh, my God, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that is a definitely a superpower, especially when, when you have those kinds of situations. And Pete, now we would like to go for the, the final, like, um, actual question. And this one is actually uh, comes from the audience and it's selected randomly. I, I kind of filtered beforehand to make sure it makes sense for, for the podcast and, and for you as a guest. So I'm going to just click here and see what comes up. So, okay, this one looks very, very interesting, especially after you described your, your process. So this person writes and I'm going to read every word. So understanding your users is super important and then you design for their needs and motivations. Can you delve a bit deeper how this happens? Do you, how do you do you go and do a brainstorming? What are you looking for in this step exactly? So I'm, I'm thinking that in your process, it would be, I, I, if I'm not recalling wrong, it would be after step four, when you've already, you know, had all, all these other situations of researching what are the, the you know, doing your, your definition of the problem, you already went through, things like the Intel, that all that Intel that you picked up, uh, all those things that you did before, you know your users, what, I mean, how do you go about doing this, if, it, if, you, if it's a brainstorming or, or the creation of those, of those game mechanics, etc. How, how do you go about that? What would be the, the, the initial steps you take? Oh, okay. Um, it depends on the budget and how much time we can spend on it. <laughs> this is the first answer. Uh, but for each I'm going to call them personas, okay? We don't always use personas, but it's a good word for the kind of process we do. For each persona, we'll then go through and think which game mechanics would work for, in this situation with this theme, would work for engaging them in this situation with this objective. And when we've done that for all the different personas, i.e. the different demographics, different player types, um, we try and find all the things that would work well together overall Um especially anything that ticks multiple boxes for the different personas, personas, you know, so if this one would work for all of them, fantastic, stick that in. <clears throat> and uh, we will prune out stuff that only fits one or two personas if, the, you know, if we don't have enough time or budget. So we'll try and please the core audience and engage them from that. But I, but I think if you can picture the person and the process they go through, so um, I quite like describing the experience and the emotions that person will experience as they go through the gamification project and the things that would appear before them and the stuff they would do to see how it works. Does that answer that question? I think that because that's my process. A lot of <laughs> sense, actually. And thank you. Thank you for that very, very detailed and, and tuned in answer to the question, Pete. So is there anything else you would, any piece of advice, anything else you want to drop in before the end of the interview? Now is, is the right time, Pete. Oh, I would say avoid leaderboards because I think they're just really risky. <laughs> um, and go big on stories and narrative. <clears throat> I think they should be used more than they are, particularly in corporate situations. 
Yeah, people get scared about writing stories, and then I, I've seen and used stuff that might only be two or three paragraphs of story to engage someone, and that will engage them for half a day. Hmm. You know, before you need to release another two or three paragraphs. That's not a lot of story. People are willing to join stories and join in, and you don't have to spend masses of time writing a whole book. <laughs> you just need to make something interesting that will engage people. So I think we should go big on those. Any any other news that you would like to, to release over here for the for the audience about gamification Europe or, or the masterclass that's coming up uh, oh, next always. June? Always. <laughs> Always. So um, the masterclass is in June. Uh, we've got five amazing gamifiers, not even including myself and Basilis, because we're going to be so busy running the event. Coming and running uh, masterclasses, one on narrative, one on a gamification design sprint, escape rooms, Lego. And uh, oh, we've got Monica Cornetti coming over from the US to do gamification for learning. It's the first time she's been to London as well to the UK. So there's a, I think there should be lots of people interested in that. And really fascinating for me is kind of a, my plan for the masterclass in London was to tap into the London market and the majority of tickets have gone to people flying in from abroad to attend. So, so far, <laughs> Which, you know, I just love how people are so passionate about gamification and they have whatever it is they need to learn and they'll go wherever in the world they need to go to find that information. I think it says a lot about our industry and why it's fun to work in. That's the masterclasses. And then the conference, the next one is in November in Amsterdam at the end of November. And we've got a two-day conference coming up. The first day is all for gamification practitioners. The second day is aimed at businesses, and it's particularly around we want to see examples of uh, culture change and digital transformation, um, you know, gamification to do that because – to a certain extent, that's the main thing we get asked for. So I know there's a lot of interest in it. And in the Netherlands, Amsterdam, there's there's a quite a big buzz for digital transformation projects. We should have, and these are not confirmed, mainly because I haven't said yes to people yet, but we've got some interesting big companies coming to speak about what they've been doing. Um, and what I'm really interested in is people who are willing to come and talk about the second or third or fourth iterations of their gamification projects. Because it's, it's quite easy to get people to come and talk about their first project because they're super excited about it. <laughs> but I think the learnings are often very similar. So we don't learn that much from that now because we've heard lots of these. So I'm really excited. I know we've got a few already and I want more. But I'm really excited to see what we can learn from you know the third, the fourth, the fifth year. The people who have been running a project and they've been tweaking it and they've been rolling it out to bigger audiences. What are we going to learn from all that? I just want to hear. I want to hear from as well in terms of case studies, and of course, I might have a speaker or two who's willing to stir things up and say what's going wrong in gamification, as well, so that we can <laughs> learn from that. Because I do like to do a bit of that. Yeah, stirring up is always is always interesting and useful for for getting you to think what you're doing. That's that's always always interesting mm -hmm. as well. But to be honest, our most popular talks at the last conference were those exact ones, the ones that made people think. The ones where we disagree with the standard way of thinking. You know, it doesn't matter if you disagree. If it makes you think about it, you'll understand why you do what you do better. Yeah, I have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pete, uh, thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you for, for coming back, for being the first repeat guest. There's a, there's a very interesting reason. and it's uh, when Do I get a badge for that? <laughs> you you should you we should probably start giving our badges to, to to our guests and especially to to a repeat guest like yourself. Last time we were talking about Gamification Europe 2017, and that's that's the reason why we didn't do a full full uh, outsized uh, interview before. But it was a it was a perfect timing, I guess, to talk about Gamification Europe. There was a couple of people who went uh, after that uh, after that interview who, who came back to us. You, you, very, you guys gave us a couple of free tickets and and we gave them away to the audience. And there was there was people going to the to the to the masterclass uh, to the to the conference thanks to that. So I think it was a perfect timing. And I think now uh, around thirty episodes after that is a, is a good time to have you to have you back because you're a fantastic designer as well. So so thank you very much for that. Thank and you. Did I even mention that tickets are available? To, no, to you buy didn't. Now. No, you yeah, didn't. We, they we are. We launched the call to adventure ticket, which is, although we haven't said who the speakers are, if you'll take a gamble on us doing two amazing fun days like we did last time, you can get your cheapest ticket now. And they're <laughs> selling quite well, which is good. 
<laughs> it's the right time. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you again, Pete, for all, all that awesomeness, for, for putting up those conferences, because I know um, I'm not sure if you're making a profit or not, and, and I'm not going to make that question. But whether or not you're making a profit, I know they, they give you a lot, a lot of headaches and work, uh, even though they're also a lot of fun and they're an opportunity for you to get to listen to people you want to listen to. So it has the two sides, but it takes a lot of work as well, as you, as you, I'm sure you know from last year. So thanks. It does. It does. I was going to run an academic one as well, but I can't, I can't face it at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Too not yet. <laughs> yeah, let's call it not yet. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's always the, the, the good answer. So Pete, how, how can people connect with you if you want to give a, a, a link as well to the to the conferences how can we get back to you ask you questions and how can we interact with gamification in europe and then we'll say it's game over cool well uh, starting with the conferences and the master classes go to gamification-europe.com and you've got access to a list of all the speakers and <clears throat> you can sign up to stay up to date with when we do launch speaker names and talks for amsterdam uh, for me reach out to me on linkedin uh, always mention What, you know that you heard it on Professor Game, then I'll understand why you're reaching out to me because I do get <laughs> by a lot of people. And uh, follow us on Twitter. Yeah, we try and stay up to date there, and that's where we'll tweet out and share interesting gamification stuff we come across as well. Fantastic! So you're Pete Jenkins across those those platforms, yeah. and the the link it will be of course in the show notes for for this episode. If you can't find Pete, which is is it going to be a difficult one? You just put on the search bar Pete or Pete Jenkins, and you'll get the two episodes and maybe do it back to back if that if, the, if you haven't heard the the first one yeah and if you can't find me i'm doing something wrong <laughs> if you can't can't find pete in a, in a, in a web page like professor game we're both doing something really really wrong <laughs> so that's it thank you again pete and it's time to say it's game over game over hey engagers thank you for listening to professor game podcast And how are you listening to this podcast? Is it through a podcasting app on your phone? Have you subscribed and rated this podcast? Please, please do so. That way we can reach more engagers like yourself to achieve our mission of making learning amazing. Hey, and by the way, before you go on to your next mission, would you like to know how to cater for intrinsic motivation and rewards? then you have to listen to Roman Rackwitz next week. It's the next episode of Professor Games. See you there. <laughs>